Okay, so in 2009, there were three teenage girls in Pennsylvania who took topless photos of themselves and sent it to their boyfriends. Now, when this was discovered by the authorities, what happened was those three boys with, were charged with possession of child pornography. <laughs> the three girls themselves, for photographing their own boobs, were charged with production and distribution of child pornography. <laughs> now, it sounds funny, but it raises some serious ethical dilemmas, like, for example, why are we charging um, children um, under child pornography laws? How is it possible that you can be both the victim and the perpetrator of the same crime? And what can possibly be gained from grouping sexually curious teenagers in with convicted pedophiles? Now, so what I'm going to talk about today is some of these issues. Um, but aside from criminalising sexting, the other way that authorities have dealt with this subject is by trying to ban children from using mobile phones. And I want to argue for the exact opposite. I don't think we should be discouraging young people from using um, mobile technology. I think we should be encouraging them to embrace it, whilst also thinking critically about some of the ethical dilemmas raised by these technologies. So to do this, I'm going to talk a bit about sex education history in Australia. Now, first it started off with abstinence education, which we know does not work. Basically, it leaves <laughs> teenagers vulnerable, unprotected. They still have sex, just not safe sex. And rates of STDs in pregnancy actually go up. <laughs> Case in point. Um, <laughs> after this, we had comprehensive sex education. But there are a number of criticisms about comprehensive sex ed. First, it's um, very focused on risk. It's all about pregnancy and STDs, but it fails to, in, in to um, engage issues like pleasure and intimacy and, heck, the female orgasm. Um, <laughs> the other problem, it's, it's still very preachy. It focuses heavily on biology at what I call the heterosexual plumbing guide. It's very heteronormative. <laughs> Um, it's all this stuff. I'm sure you all got it in high school. And the other thing to remember is that the people responsible for teaching high school students about this stuff are often PE teachers who would rather be out on the field not talking about complex sociological issues around gender and sexuality. So, oh, and then the biggest problem though, and this I think is the most interesting criticism, is that up until recently there has not been a single um, education in... Um, process in Australia, sex ed that is, that has been developed in consultation with young people or evaluated by young people. So it's a bunch of adults assuming that they know what's best for young people to hear about. <coughs> now in response to this deficit, recently um, Professor Moira Carmody decided that what she was going to do is number one, actually go out and speak to young people and ask them about what, we were, what was of concern to them. Phase two was to then develop a sexual ethics program that talked about mo those more complex issues like, well, if a person is really drunk, at what point do they lose the capacity to give consent? Or if you're at a party on the weekend and someone's really trashed and you see they're being taken advantage of, do you have... <laughs> poor choice in timing. <laughs> do you have a responsibility as an ethical bystander to intervene? <laughs> um, now, this is great. And I've come along and I've gone, Maura, I love your work, but my one problem is you have not talked about technology. And this is hugely problematic. What we need is people to sit around in a round table like this and th thrash out all the issues, including the technological ones. Because so much of young people's sexual lives has been conducted through technology. And I'm not just talking about sexting. I'm talking about how people court, how they flirt. They do it online. And we want happy young people um, who are enjoying um, their technology, not just, you know, we should avoid demonising the technology. So what I propose doing is to mo emulate her study. Phase one is to go out and actually speak to young people about how they're integrating the um, technology into their courtship processes and some of the pleasurable aspects of that. It's not all doom and gloom that we should be banning the technology. Phase two will then be to actually produce an ethics-based um, technology, sex and ethics technology program that talks to teens <laughs> about this stuff because this is the reality of how teens are having sex these days and we're naive if we're going to ignore that. So why does this matter? Why should you care? Well, I guess, you know, if you have teens, you probably... If you don't have teens, you probably don't. But you should, because there are broader ramifications about techno-ethics. At the moment, there are lots of people who are asking, how can we make the technology more user-friendly? And I think that's important. But we also need to be asking, how can we make technology users themselves more friendly with one another? And thinking through some of those um, ethical dilemmas and basically doing this, getting our hands dirty as we talk about this stuff, thrashing out the issues, talking about the ethics of hacking and, um, and cracking and talking about the ethics of cyberbullying and some of these issues. So finally, I guess the last slide that I want to end it on is talking about this idea of forming bridges and intersecting communities because so often those in sociology, those in techno studies, 
those in ethics, um, those in education, don't communicate with one another. And if we're ever going to advance in um, techno-ethics education research, we need to all be talking with one another. So that's me, I'm Nina Fennell, I'm a researcher at UNSW, and thanks very much, enjoy your day. <laughs>